Today, I'm talking to Professor Keith Jerome uh, of the Vaccine and Infectious Disease Division at the Fred Hutch. Thanks so much, Keith, for joining us today. Yeah, I'm happy to speak. Now, I know that you've been involved a lot in the testing efforts that have been going on, and there have been a number of stories about you in the press. And um, there has been a lot of focus on what has gone wrong in testing of COVID. Um, and what I wanted to do instead is focus on what went right, because I think your team did a lot of what's right. So. Can you tell us, in your estimation, what was it that you and, and your colleagues uh, did well when this was emerging? Well, I think we really made one really big decision that was right, and that was we were following this in late December and early January like everybody else, but about the middle of January, we just had a talk and, and, and basically decided that, look, this I will tell you the truth. I didn't think that this was going to come to the United States. I didn't think this was going to turn into a global pandemic. I didn't think any of that was going to happen. I was completely wrong on that. But where I, where I was right was to say, even though I believe all that, we need to start getting ready just in case. And so we started doing all the groundwork you need to do to develop a diagnostic test. We designed primers and probes for a PCR. We thought about what the workflow would look like. Um, we started to get some some materials that we could use to see if everything worked right. And we, we basically started. Um, and of course, every day after that, there was never any news that said we were doing something silly. But I really did tell the team, I said, this is, early on, I said, this is probably gonna be a waste of money, it's probably gonna be a waste of our time, but we have to do it anyway. And in retrospect, it turned out to be the right thing. Yeah, for sure. Um, so you have, progressively ramped up the number of tests that you're able to do. So how many are you at now? Well, we're doing on a busy day about 3,000 for clinical purposes and, and really every day. And it seems that the, the limitation for that is just the healthcare system and the availability of swabs and people in the protective gear to take them and all those things that you're reading about in the paper. So we could do more. Um, what we're doing with sort of, you know, what I would call our excess capacity is we're partnering with people who are doing research studies, for example, on questions like does, does chloroquine work? And if it does, is it better to give that early in therapy versus later? Um, I hope we can be involved in some of the vaccine trials as those move forward. So all this capacity is going to good use. Um, you know, we're, we reread these stories and it is a source of frustration that the system just actually can't always get us samples so that we can test as many people as we actually mm. have the ability to do. And how long does it take the results to get back to the people who, who are testing? Yeah, so that's something that we've been really proud of. Um, we, for our internal people in the University of Washington system, from the time that a sample is drawn until they have a result, uh, the median time that is half or faster, half or slower, is right about nine hours. Wow. It's usually a little bit under nine hours. Um, so that's really great because if you think about it, the entire time we have a patient and we're worried they might have COVID, we've got to have all the garb on and the hoods and the pressure and all this stuff, right? It's a huge amount of uh, protective gear. Once we know that patient doesn't have the disease, um, we can go back to more standard precautions that are not nearly so onerous on the healthcare people. So turnaround time, is critical. In fact, uh, our chair says, you know, turnaround time equals personal protective equipment. It, it, there is a one-to-one a, a -one correlation almost. Um, now for samples that we get from outside the country from the time, or excuse me, from outside Seattle, outside our system for other parts of the country, you know, we've done Connecticut and we've done Idaho and Florida. So we've done all these, but um, from the time that they hit our lab from a FedEx delivery, until we get the results a little bit slower. It's usually about 12 to 14 hours. But what that means is that, you know, despite the fact that somebody might need to send a sample of 2,000 miles to get to us, by the following evening, they're gonna have the result. Well, you're actually bringing up an issue that I wanted to talk about a little bit. Um, Dr. Fauci, whom we both know and love, um, right. was a guest on the New York Times Daily Podcast the morning of April 2nd, and he was asked about the pros and cons of having a national response versus a kind of more local or, or state level response. And I want to turn that question a little bit more to this testing issue, which is, I think we found ourselves in difficulty at the beginning because we had this national system for testing. 
for understandable reasons that you don't want every charlatan, for example, out there claiming that they have a test when really they don't. On the other hand, um, you know, that really actually ended up slowing down. So yeah. do you, what do you hope the system looks like after this pandemic has settled down and, and we can reorganize the system? Well, one of the big lessons, in my opinion, that, that, that the public needs to understand, that policymakers need to understand, is that when you look at who can actually do lots and lots and lots of tests in this country, who can, who can do thousands, who can do tens of thousands of tests, it's not CDC, it's not the state labs. The people who can do lots of tests are academic medical centers like ours, they're big laboratory companies like LabCorp and Quest. And, and these are the providers who day in and day out are doing test after test that you never think about. This is part of routine care. Um, people tend, who aren't in this field, people tend to think about the CDC and the state labs as these behemoths who can do everything. They can do an incredible variety of things, but they exist to do surveillance to make sure that something's not sneaking into the country. Oh, suddenly we find there's a new disease. They're great at finding that. But once you have to do thousands of tests, this, they're not built for that. Um, but we have labs that are, and I think where we were slow at the beginning was in not tapping into that expertise. Do you have any, um, any sense of ways in which you're operating by having learned what you've learned from HIV? Well, we've certainly taken a lot of lessons from um, the experience of, of modeling HIV and the, you know, the phases of infection, you know, how the virus has a huge peak early on and then sort of falls to a different level and thinking about what that means, both how high the load, what that means to how a person is going to do with an infection, whether it's HIV or COVID, um, understanding how that involve, is involved with the likelihood of transmission. So those things are all a lot of lessons. Um, and in, in you know, our experience with working with HIV diagnostics has been incredibly useful, and we've, we've leaned upon that in this response. You know, we learn lessons from one virus to another, but the other thing that always, you know, humbles me is every virus is different in some way, and you can't take those lessons one for one. You have to take them, boil them together, mix them all up, and understand how that can be applied to the new virus. Mm. And one difference, too, between HIV and COVID is um, that the first HIV test that became available was actually an antibody test. And it's the test that yeah. people rely on, you know, for HIV diagnoses most of the time. And we don't have that yet for COVID. And I'd love to have you explain for people the difference between the kind of tests we do have now for COVID versus an antibody test and why we still really would love to have an antibody test. How is that going to be useful for us? Yeah, so typically when we diagnose a, a viral infection, there's kind of two big, two main categories of tests that we do. One is we just look for the virus itself. It's usually by PCR. A lot of people have heard about PCR. Essentially, you, you take, if there's a tiny bit of virus in a sample, whether it be blood or a nasal swab, you do this, what we call an amplification, and you make lots and lots of copies of a little tiny part of it you can detect that. So we, we turn a, a little bit into a lot of that little part, not the whole thing, and then we can detect it. So that's how PCR works. Um, so that's great. We know the virus is there. So if somebody gets a viral load for their HIV, that's we're looking for the virus. We're, we're detecting how much they have in the blood. And typically when someone gets a nasal swab for COVID, we're looking for actually the virus being in their nose. Okay. Um, we're actually worried about the virus being in their lungs, but it also is in the nose so that we can detect it and make the diagnosis. Um, in this case, those were the, 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 as technology has progressed, those are actually the easier tests to bring on fast now. So, so I was telling you about January, we realized we have to get going on this. It's relatively easy for us to make a PCR test. So in a matter of weeks, we had a test that was ready to go, we could trust. Um, the other kind of tests you talk about are these antibody tests. And the idea there is you're not looking for the virus, you're looking for the body's reaction to the virus. Remember the body wants to fight these viruses off and the body makes antibodies to fight against the virus. And long before we knew how to do PCR, we knew how to detect those viruses. This is actually kind of an old technology actually, but they work really well together because you can look for the virus now 
But the antibodies hang around even after the virus has been cleared for, for the sorts of viruses that we get rid of, right? Um, you know, we don't, we don't clear HIV, but, but we clear some of these other ones. And so even if the virus is gone, you can say, oh, well, you had it. You know, we, we can't find the virus now, but, but we know your body is telling us you had it and you fought it off. Now, where we're going to get over the next months and as we go into summer is hopefully we're going to be on the far side of the peak of this. There'll probably still be new infections. We'll probably still be dealing with this to some degree. But the question is going to be more, well, did I, did I have it? Was that, you know, that little cough? I had that runny nose, you know. Was that COVID? And if so, does that mean I, I'm, not, I'm not susceptible anymore? I'm immune to it, right? And so we need to have those antibody tests available. Now, so they're, they're fulfilling a different purpose there than they were for HIV, because we know, you know the antibodies to HIV aren't going to prevent you from getting it. You already have it. It's not going to clear it. So it helped us know, yes or no, there was infection. But for COVID, it might say, wow, you, you must have had a really mild case. Good for you. Um, hopefully you don't have to worry about it for a while. Now that's a hopefully because we don't know the answer to that yet. My laboratory together with others is working on that. If you have those antibodies, are you safe? Are you not? Are there certain antibodies that tell us more than others? A lot of questions there, but that's the goal is maybe we can tell people, yeah, you can go back to work. You can, you know, work in your restaurant or, you know, work in the grocery store and not have to worry about, you know, everybody who comes through these sorts of things, try to get, you know, the country and our cities maybe back on our feet again. Boy, that sounds, that sounds like a great day that, yeah. to look forward to. Hopefully we can do it. Yeah, really. Keith, um, I want to thank you so much for the time you've taken to uh, explain all these testing issues with us today. Thanks so much and stay safe. Okay, you too, Rowena. Thank you.